Good evening, grandchildren. I didn't make a journal entry last week because I was treasure hunting for like four or five days, I don't know, with Logan and for a real actual treasure, and it was super exciting. Spoiler alert, I did not find a treasure, but I found the treasure of friendship with Logan, my already best friend, so I feel like I don't need... I already had that treasure, really. So it, was, it was a waste of time. It was a lot of fun, though. I'm, I'm just so tired. I'm... Nobody watches this, so I'm, it's not like I have sponsors or anything. So many people have like a vice, and for some like I don't smoke, I don't drink, I, I like I don't have something that I like need to do in my life, except for occasionally. This is like probably the least healthy thing that I partake in. It's like an energy drinks became a really big thing a couple of years ago, but then everybody in the news was saying that it's like. If you drink too many of them, you're gonna get a heart attack or something. I don't know, I get a little bit shaky when I drink them, but it also wakes me up because there's a shit ton of caffeine in here. And also when you pop it open, a little bit of like smoke comes up, which I think that means that it's pure poison. But I'm gonna drink it because I I hate coffee and this is the only thing that'll, I, I don't know why I talk about things for this long. I need to tell you guys about the treasure hunting story. I'm just gonna, Delicious. I am not affiliated with Monster Energy Drinks. I'm just so tired. I need a minute. Just I'm gonna roll the the intro musicy thingy for a second, and then just keep watching. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm back. Treasure hunting. Uh, it was uh, crazy. The Thursday, last Thursday is when I actually left to go treasure hunting. And okay, so first things first. This is an actual treasure that exists. We're not, I'm not making that part up. It allegedly exists. Nobody's found it yet, obviously. Uh, but it started with this dude named Forrest Venn, who is a very wealthy and successful art dealer in Santa Fe, who used to be, uh, I believe, like an archaeologist or something, and a treasure hunter, and he was in a one of the wars that happened. I'm sorry, Forrest Venn, if you're watching this. I, I knew at one point, but I'm blanking right now which war you were in. Also, I wasn't alive for any of the major wars, so they kind of merge together. For me. Forrest Fenn is pretty much the equivalent of like Indiana Jones, but actually alive and in some ways kind of cooler. He has a lot of money and he actually found a ton of treasure throughout his life and he didn't want to give it all to his family. Uh, he wanted to also give something back to the world for what the world gave to him uh, in his life. So he set out to hide a treasure uh, a few years back and uh, it contains somewhere between like one and three million dollars in gold and ancient artifacts uh, that he's found over his life in an actual like bronze treasure chest. And that's actually a picture that he had commissioned of the treasure before he hid it. He did somewhere in the Rocky Mountains and wrote a book including a map and a poem of how to find the treasure. So you'd think that it'd be pretty straightforward uh, how to find the treasure if he wrote instructions and they're available for anyone to find. Nope. Nope, it's not easy. Not that easy, actually. Uh, people have been looking for so long, so many years, and no one's found it yet. So the likelihood that Logan and I would find it immediately after a few months of Googling was very unlikely. The poem went something like this, uh, at least the after the intro part. Uh, Begin it where warm waters halt, and take it the canyon down. Not far, but too far to walk, put in below the home of Brown. So the entire poem's like this, so you can kind of, you probably assume that this is like, I mean, it's just, it's like one of those lateral thinking puzzles or something, or Forrest Fenn is just awful at making riddles. We don't know. But it, like, I mean, it, it, he, you have to follow it in order. It begins at the first stage of your search and it goes like linearly through the process of finding it. So you have to think, first figure out what the hell begin it where warm waters halt means, which Nobody knows for sure. There's plenty of ideas floating around about what that means, like uh, beginning where warm water salt, that could be hot springs, because the hot springs come out and then the warm water becomes cold. So that that's a thing that it could be. Warm waters, as we discovered, is also a term used by fly f fishermen, at least somewhere in the world, uh, for water that has a lot of trout in it, perfect for fly fishing in. And apparently Forrest Fenn was an avid fly fisher, or so I've heard, but there's a lot of 
mean the bad incorrectness on the internet so you never know and it could mean that warm like water is becoming colder so it could be somewhere where ice forms like at the top of a mountain where water that is maybe not warm warm but mm, liquid uh, freezes somewhere so that's the first part you have to start there beginning where warm water salt there's no like solid it's not like beginning in michigan uh it, it, it's beginning where warm water salt and there's just you know what he knows for sure he hasn't said anything for sure and then you gotta figure it out from there then take the canyon down i'm assuming that that has some confusing shit to it that we can't figure out, but it seems pretty straightforward that you take a canyon down. Not far, but too far to walk. What the hell does that mean? Do you get in a little rowboat and paddle somewhere? Do you have to drive to this spot instead of starting it where Warm Water's Hall? But it said beginning where Warm Water's Hall, so that doesn't make sense. Put in below the home of Brown, and Brown is capitalized, and that's the only proper noun in the entire poem, so that must mean something. There's Brown Mountain, Brown Campground, all kinds of Browns throughout all the four states that it could be in, so this is just infuriating trying to figure it out. But Logan and I spent, like, two months analyzing the poem and searching Google Maps and trying to compare things and map everything out. And we found a spot that we thought kind of fit the beginning part at least of the poem, so we decided we wanted to go. Uh, unfortunately, we live in California, or I live in California. He's currently going to school in Oregon. Uh, so that's gonna be like, approximately 20 hours away, one direction. And last Thursday was when we were gonna start our trip and that morning I had to go to work and what do you know, my phone started dying. It had been acting weird a couple weeks beforehand but it finally started losing battery charge faster than it would gain battery charge. So I needed to get a new phone for the trip uh, before we went because we needed the GPS on the phone in order to figure out everything and also all of our music because we both made 20 hours of music on a play on Spotify playlists and combined it together so that we would have constant music throughout the, throughout the trip because it was like 40 hours total. So we had a 40 hour playlist that had to be played on my phone because Logan doesn't have a smartphone and he has a basic phone. So I was just really stressed out Thursday morning and I needed a new phone. So I went on Craigslist because that's the only thing I think of doing. And uh, I saw an ad for a guy that was selling a phone for like 50 bucks, his little smartphone. Uh, probably gonna be really shitty, but I needed a phone and mine was dead. So that was the only option that I had. So I met this dude in a random sketchy parking lot in a city that I'd never been to, traded him $50 for a phone that he probably stole from somebody. But it was worth it because it worked, so no complaints here. Anyway, I got off work early that day and went up to Eugene, which is five hours away. I began reading an audiobook called Orcs and Crake, which I finished and it was fantastic. Orcs and Crake was a really good book. It's, it's really weird for like the first half of it. So like, I, I, it was an audiobook for me. So the first five hours out of the 10 hours of the book, just, I had no idea what was going on. It's really non-linear. Like there's this movie called Pulp Fiction that jumps around a lot. It's kind of like that. Uh, there's just jumping around between things and no idea what's happening. But then the last half of it, it really started clicking and it was just a fantastic story. Anyway, I, I diverge. I went, I went five hours up to Eugene to see Logan. We went a little bit shopping for food along the way. Uh, cause he, he gets like points. They have like, he's, the University of Oregon has like a point system for their food and they, uh, it's kind of like shopping, but for people who aren't quite grown ups yet. So you don't actually deal with real money. Yeah, like all of the point values are like even like integers. So there's no like, it's a dollar and 50 cents. It's like just one point or three points or seven points. Uh, so it's a little bit easier to keep track of everything. And they have a little bit of a li more limited supply of food than at a regular grocery store. Anyway, we got a bunch of food and we went on our way and drove. And this is when we made the first mistake was that the moment we got in the car, we were talking. And I know that it makes sense that we'd want to talk, but we didn't stop talking. We started talking the moment that we saw each other until we went to sleep and then we'd wake up the next morning and then we'd keep talking from that moment on until we went to sleep the next night. And at first, it's, I'll, I'll get to that when I get to the end of the story, but that was... Uh, that just did not end up well. We drove for like six hours and we, we had to go up to Portland and we drove through Portland and then we had to, we think we stopped somewhere in Oregon, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and we slept in my car. Every single night of this trip, we slept in my car. And my car is not big enough to fit uh, an entire human body. So two people was a little bit pushing it, but we managed. We woke up the next morning and we drove to this place called, I think it's Palouse Falls, is that how you say it? I don't know, but it was absolutely beautiful. We took a bunch of pictures like traditional tourists do because we didn't have enough time <laughs> to actually really enjoy it. We just didn't have enough time to get out of the car and look at it and then run back to the car because we had a very tight schedule because it was 40 hours total of driving over that four days and one whole day was gonna be taken away from by treasure hunting. Driving and it, there was a lot of just really beautiful stuff along the way and I'm really happy that we went on the trip because you kind of learn about like, I mean, I, I don't know, I've been in California my whole life and it's really cool to just kind of realize how big the world is. And you see all this stuff that you never, like I've seen, I saw landscapes on this trip 
that I never would have thought existed. Uh, it just, I, I can't even describe some of it. It was just absolutely beautiful, some of these parts of America that I'd never seen. And I really feel like I know a little bit more about the country itself just from driving through all of it. Even with, like we stopped in a few places and just like the slight differences in how people act. And it was just really actually enjoyable to drive all that way, even though that sounds ridiculous. So that day after Palace Falls, we kept driving, almost ran out of gas a couple times. Uh, and then that was, we started getting into the types of places in the United States where people don't give a shit about marketing anymore. And by that, I mean like they don't want to have fancy names for everything because it's just such a tiny town that they don't have enough that you need to distinguish things by names anymore. So the gas stations were all just called gas. And the restaurants were all called restaurants. You didn't even know what you were getting into. Every sign that we saw, like this one strip of Washington was just like gas, food, restaurant, hotel. Nothing had actual like names. It was just the name of the thing. But just straightforward actually. I kind of like it. The idea of like, I don't have to worry about what company is doing this. It's just, that's the thing that I need right now. That name and just a bright sign that says food. And later on a drive, we ended up needing to stop for gas. And we saw the store called the 50,000 silver dollar coin or something like that. I can't remember the name exactly. It was really weird. I'd never heard of it before, but it just like looked like this old tiny building. We went in and they had like a little restaurant and a bunch of souvenirs and stuff. And we were looking around at everything we found two cowboy hats so we we bought those obviously because we can't be proper adventurers going out looking for treasure without cowboy hats or pirate hats and in this situation they didn't have pirate hats so let's go with cowboy hats and literally the rest of this journey that i'm going to tell you about took place in our cowboy hats our location that we were going to go searching for this treasure was this place called brown mountain campgrounds uh in wyoming we didn't find anything there uh Anyone else who sees this, even you grandchildren, if the treasure's still out there, free to look there if you want. We looked for an entire day, couldn't find anything, nothing that really obviously fit the poem. That, uh, anyway, the night before, though, um, we slept in a, outside of a town called Matitsi, I think? Is that where? I don't know, actually. I, uh, Logan might watch this and just get angry at me for how incorrect this was, but he's not here right now and I'm telling the story, so let's just assume that it was Matitsi. The next day we woke up like an hour out of Brown Mountain Campground, we drove and we reached uh, this area and then slowly as we started approaching the Shoshone like National Forest I think we were in, uh, it just became beautiful. Like it was one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. And honestly, like, I mean, Per, for me, it was better than a lot of like national parks. I, I mean, the, the national parks, there's a lot of really beautiful things in it, but I just loved this mountain range that we were in. Anyway, we drove past the campground and... God, that hand is terrifying. Also, why is there so many fingers? Wait, no, that's, oh, that's a bucket of water. Oh, okay. <laughs> They'll learn much more than we'll know and think to myself. The first big obstacle that we had on our journey was getting my car, which is two-wheel drive, through like three creeks. And it was like, I mean, it wasn't too bad, but the water was like this high in some parts, maybe like that actually. Oh, you can't even see both my hands. Like, like, uh, I don't know, it's like a couple feet deep in some parts, but it was also like, we didn't know what the, if, how sandy it was. And I mean, it's a two-wheel drive car. So it's like, if we get stuck, we're not getting out unless somebody else helps us. And we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. There's not too many people, enough people that eventually we would have gotten help. But in the meantime, no. So right up there's where it gets bad though. Like I honestly, I don't know if we'd want to, how far is it from here? No, it's seven miles. That looks really deep. Yeah, it was just the most terrifying thing. We had to get like pumped up and then we we almost actually stopped the car and backpacked our way into the forest. But then we kind of changed our mind when we saw somebody else go through it. And we just decided to like put on loud music and plow our way through the creek. And um, I attached my GoPro right now. I don't know if we actually got footage because the battery was dying a lot. If I have footage, I'm gonna put that on the screen right now. I know that at least one of my cameras was recording. So you might be able to see like our faces. <laughs> Jazz fancy pants. I feel like we need momentum. Very well. Ah. Keep on going. Oh my god. Anyway, we made it through the first creek, terrifying, but my car somehow made it. And the next two creeks were a little bit less nerve wracking because I knew that I could pull off that one. We were going in uh, as close as possible to this old, like, abandoned mining town. 
I forgot the name of the town, so I'm looking it up right now so I can tell you guys about it. Kerwin! Kerwin is the name of the town that we were going to. It's like an old abandoned mining town. We were reading all kinds of stuff about it, and it was actually really interesting. Like, all these different, like, mining shafts all over the mountains in that area, mostly closed off by the government when they shut down because it was a hazard for people. But um, it was like a small town of mining people, and it was actually really funny because one of the signs said it was, like, a really, like, they, they were proud of, like, the purity of the people and, like, they, they liked everything, the system that they had, and then they had one woman who claimed to be a fortune teller named Lucille, uh, who ended up actually being a prostitute and was kicked out because she had to go in and try to ruin everything with sex. The lesson here, grandchildren, is that if you ever have sex, everybody you know will abandon you, including me. Anyway, so we parked the car and we got out. We started looking in like places that we kind of theorized it would be. Oh, there it is. We went up this creek, uh, like look just looking for clues for the treasure and stuff. And we actually found this old like where there was like a toppled over mine cart that was left over from in the like the old mining days like a hundred years ago. And we actually found the entrance to a mining tunnel that had been built like blocked off with bricks and stuff, and we kept walking. It was, pro it was a pretty intense, actually, path following the creek, and there was like snow and then these beautiful mountains everywhere. We took some pictures, we kept going, and uh, we were also talking a lot about bears because this is definitely grizzly bear country, and I remember Logan saying, and I don't know how uh, accurate this is, but it, I believe it's accurate. The kind of place that we were staying in right there is like, it's one of the only places in the United States left that had the same like animals that were alive when Lewis and Clark made their expedition across the country. Some of the first explorers, the first like colonial explorers of the United States, they went through the United States before it was all colonized and everything. And I mean, there was Native Americans and stuff, but they were the first, like they didn't really know what they were getting into. And that's kind of like the perfect adventure really, going across a new land that no one of your kind has ever explored before. This place allegedly has all the same animals that were alive when Lewis and Clark trekked across the United States, which is really kind of exciting and terrifying because uh, that isn't just like, you know, jackrabbits and whatnot. This is like grizzly bears and and like mountain lions. Pr pretty much the most intense of them is the grizzly bear, which we had been talking about, I guess neither of us really knew too much about grizzly bears. Uh, the thing about grizzly bears is that unlike some of the bears that you encounter in your life, grizzly bears, uh, you're not supposed to fight back. Like you know, some bears, they say like, be all big and try to like scare them and be like, I'm a bear also, rawr. And then they run away because they were just like, trying to intimidate you or whatever, but then they were like, oh shit, this guy's messing with us. And then they run away. But with a grizzly bear, um, they're very territorial apparently, and they they can like run 40 miles an hour, and they're just super giant carnivorous beasts like that run at you and try to kill you. And uh, they also, they don't like it if you run away, that they have an instinct when you try to run away to chase whatever's running away. So you're supposed to just say absolutely still. And also they don't like it when you fight back. There's actually a movie that just came out called The Revenant and there was a very violent grizzly bear attack in that movie. We were pretty much assuming that if we got attacked by a grizzly bear, it would be like in the movie The Revenant with Leonardo DiCaprio, where he was pretty much destroyed by a bear. And that's how the whole story kind of begins. But like if a, if a grizzly bear attacks you, you apparently you're supposed to just let it eat you. Let it do whatever it wants to because it's the boss of you now and the best chance you have of surviving is just letting it do whatever it's doing to your body including gnawing on your head or eating your guts because you can kind of hope and pray that it'll get bored and then walk away thinking that you're dead and then you can kind of like once it leaves scamper off and go to the hospital or whatever. Part of me kind of feels like that's the grizzly bears that with those instructions like no don't run away from us don't fight back just let us eat you. <laughs> That's my bear impression. Remember that, I'm really good at impressions. Uh, so we didn't find treasure up that creek, and we went and explored Kerwin a little bit, saw all these like machines that they used to use actually for when they were mining, and like all this stuff that was still kind of like intact, and some of it that was a little bit restored. And we met a couple of the people, um, including this guy, while I was setting up a tent and then Logan was looking for a firewood, this guy started talking to me and he had like a big gun on one side and then a can of bear spray on the other. Uh, and he was like, so uh, you guys have an electric fence? And I thought that that was ridiculous initially. Uh, 
because like an electric fence, I feel like that's a big like industrial type thing. But he's talking about like they have camping electrical fences to help you know deter wildlife, and you can actually bring them with you and put them around your tent to kind of make animals not go into your tent. And I was like, what? No, we're just going to put the tent out. And this is like this big guy with mutton chops that was just really intense and awesome that had a gun and barrel spray that looked like he knew what he was doing. And he's like, oh, okay. And I was like, well, like, uh, 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 do you think it's safe to sleep in a tent? And he... He's like, well, I mean, personally, I sleep in my car. And he pointed back to, like, this huge, just this super intense, like, hunter van type thing. Like, a big truck with, like, the back on it. And it was like, this intense guy is sleeping in his car. And we were thinking about sleeping in our tent that night. We slept in our car the last couple of nights. So we wanted to break from it and actually sleep in the tent. But then this guy's like, I don't know, the master of the wilderness that's telling us that's a... Kind of, well, you didn't say it. We, I kept asking him, and he kind of, like, was going back and forth on it. But he, he was pretty much implying that it was a bad idea to sleep in a tent here. And, and he, he said he, like, tracked gri- like he tracked some grizzly bears a couple hundred yards up the trail from where we were right then. And all the grizzly bears were waking up and, com- like, coming out of hibernation right then. So uh, we were a little bit more on edge after that. We also went up exploring uh, the path a little bit up from there along the Wood River. And it was really like i mean it was really cool we didn't end up finding anything uh, again we found all these like old abandoned buildings along the way including an old cabin that was being built for amelia Earhart before she disappeared like she and her husband at the time were like they got this other guy i think to build them a cabin and then she went and disappeared and they didn't need to build the cabin anymore so there's like this half built cabin that we saw that was going to be Amelia Earhart's home before she had disappeared. Just the landscape was one of the most beautiful things that I had ever seen. It was, I know, just an incredible, like, I mean, just an incredible hike, really. Like, it had become worth it right then to go on this adventure just because of how beautiful this was. And that's we were kind of talking about how it's like, we didn't really need to find a treasure to be happy with it. Forest Fen's, like, treasure was almost like, just an excuse for us to go out on our own little adventure and go to this place we'd never been to. I'm really actually thankful for Forrest Fenn because he brought us to this place that we would never would have been to before if it hadn't been for him. I mean, we didn't find anything. We ended up, we end, we we had a little fire and it was a really, really nice dinner kind of thing that we had. We ate our food and we had like, Logan had gotten pizza before we left, but he didn't pay for them. There was a, he told me about there was this, this thing called the Undie Run at uh, University of Oregon or near University of Oregon where a bunch of people, I think for some cause or something, it was like a fundraising thing, but everyone just goes out and jogs in their underwear. Uh, and he went to that, but he, he saw someone on the way that was carrying a pizza and it, like an entire pizza and telling somebody else how they got it for free. And Logan had asked that, uh, that girl where she got the pizza from. And she said that there was just this house that was giving him out boxes of pizza. So he ran over to that house and he just got two boxes of pizza for free. Anyway, so we had that pizza in our car for like kind of food along the way, along with a couple other things. But we ended up cooking our pizza next to the fire, like on a little slanted rock in with the fire. And it was actually delicious. Some of the best pizza I've ever had heated up on a rock by a fire. We ended up uh, chickening out of the tent thing. One, because of grizzly bears. Two, because of how freaking cold it was going to get. It was going to get like 30 degrees. And also, I had forgotten my sleeping bag, of all things, uh, to take with me on the journey. So I just had a ton of blankets and comforters from my car. But, uh, I mean, that's not going to really insulate me too much while we're sleeping. And you kind of like, you need a little bit of like separation from the ground or it's just going to get absolutely freezing. So we decided to sleep with my car because it might be a little bit warmer than in the tent and we don't have to worry as much about grizzly bears. Also, mistake. You're supposed to try to minimize the amount of food smells that are coming from your camp and stuff. But we were burning uh, stuff in our fire and I had a Taco Bell bag in my car and we decided to burn that to get rid of like the trash and stuff. And we were already burning a bunch of stuff. And that was the biggest mistake, I think, of the night because immediately the bag is just covered in like Taco Bell juice or whatever. And the entire fire smelt like burrito to me. And it just filled like the air around us. And I'm pretty sure if, if, if bears like Taco Bell, any bear in the five mile radius would have definitely smelled this and wanted to come over to us. Uh, we slept in the car that night. We woke up the next day and we went driving and um, 
Fortunately, we kind of a little bit planned for failure. We wanted to like stop places along the way of our journey in case we didn't find treasure, which was, you know, inevitable. Uh, but the next day we drove through Yellowstone, which is absolutely just beautiful and incredible. Uh, we bought a little bit of fireworks in Wyoming. And we kept driving because the next day, which was Monday, that, that morning we were gonna go river rafting. We, we drove pretty much the entire day. We went through, I believe, Boise which I'd heard about before. I think there's a college there or something, but now I can say I've been to Boise and it wasn't that exciting. Uh, and we drove and uh, found somewhere to park and sleep near the, the river rafting place. The next day we were river rafting and unfortunately my GoPro had a dead battery. My car stopped charging things through the little cigarette plug port. So I didn't, I can't, I don't have any proof of this that I went, uh, but we both woke up the next morning and we, like at eight o'clock and we went river rafting Which was just absolutely incredible and I thought it was just a ton of fun I'd never been river rafting before in my life And it was just there was a, it was a lot of fun and like kind of like a little bit of work in some points because you have to like You have to do a lot of work with the paddling and stuff to make sure you guys don't flip So a little bit of flipping is on you if you're not putting in enough work if it happens uh, But I mean it was just absolutely like a great experience and then after that we started driving through like the rest of Idaho and then through Oregon and then that night at like six or seven o'clock we ended up back in Eugene uh, at University of Oregon where Logan uh, goes to school. He had, he had a couple extra points from a day that we weren't there for food and everything so we both got dinner at the cafeteria place at University of Oregon and we said goodbye and then I headed back for like five hours after that. I got back at like two in the morning, finished that book um, and then I went to work the next day. Actually, I forgot the one part. Right before we got to University of Oregon, we, like, that was probably the roughest time. Like, that that entire day, we were just kind of getting on each other's nerves. And I think it was because of how much we were talking. Because we never really stopped talking. We'd wake up, talk the entire day, no matter what we were doing or where we went. And then go talk uh, until we went to sleep that night. So, it was literally just every waking minute of those, like, five days was spent talking to each other and we were just i mean i think if you talk to anyone non-stop for that long eventually you're gonna start getting irritated with them and there was like this stretch of desert that had nothing pretty about it no redeeming qualities and we were just getting really frustrated at each other and not enjoying anything and the solution actually which i thought was really funny is um logan took a nap which, it wasn't like Logan's fault that we were angry with each other. I think it's kind of funny that's like, you needed a nap, Logan, that's all. But really, I think the issue was that because we were talking so much, we didn't have a break from each other. And he didn't, I don't even think he took really that much of a nap. He might've fallen asleep here or there, but he's he said that he was like, it was pretty much like 40 minutes of him just kind of laying there with his eyes closed, resting. And I was driving and that kind of like break for an hour from each other was enough that it was you know kind of like reset everything and we weren't as angry with each other and then when he got back up we started talking again just like right at the beginning of the trip and the rest of the way it was just really really nice so eventually i got back home and i went to sleep that night woke up the next day and went back to work it's really interesting when you do something like that because everybody else is just kind of doing their normal life kind of thing like people probably just went home, played video games, or slept that weekend. Maybe it was Memorial Day weekend, so, uh, you know, Memorial Day people would hang out with their families, and maybe a couple people were going on trips places. But there's a lot of people who didn't really do that much, and they just kind of, you know, lived regular life. And so it's just really weird, the, the difference between the two, because it kind of felt like our own little world going on this journey inside my car for, for like five days. But I think it was, it was very much needed by both of us. There's, it's really nice having that, that break from real life and the stress of the regular world and being able to like, I mean, it's very definitely stressful going out and doing something like that, especially trying to find treasure because we're, we're both like the entire time getting on each other's nerves and trying to like, we're like, well, I think that this means this and I think that this means this and this own brand of stress that you get from that kind of thing. But it's, it's, I think it's really healthy and good for a person to have that shift and stretch where you're not worried about work and the people at work or I need to get this done. Or, I mean, if you're dealing with like family problems and all that stuff, that's just day in and day out. It's nice to have that kind of little break from all of it and being able to, to go out and worry about something else or at some point nothing at all. Cause there was definitely a couple points where we were 
you know, out there in those mountains. And it was just absolutely beautiful. And he didn't really worry about anything. Even like with bears and stuff, like you can kind of just put that in your mind for a little bit and just enjoy how beautiful everything was and how fun the, you know, the adventuring over there was. It's a really important thing to, you know, just to not go crazy. Anyway, I am very tired and I still have work that I need to do tonight. But uh, that's it. That was Logan and I going treasure hunting in Wyoming for Forest Fen's hidden treasure. We did not find it, unfortunately. We're probably going to go again at some point somewhere else looking for it. So maybe there's still hope. But yeah, uh, anyway, grandchildren, if you see me anytime in the near future, we should bury a treasure or a time capsule or something. We should do that or go searching for a treasure. Either one's fine. Hiding a treasure, I think, is better because you don't have to be sad about not finding it and you get to be excited about somebody else finding it. And so it's like really, you don't, you're not disappointed when you're hiding treasure. You're only disappointed when you're finding treasure. But yeah, we should, we should go hide a treasure somewhere, bury it, maybe in the backyard and then make our own little riddle for it. Actually, maybe not the backyard. We should actually maybe do like a series. I don't know. We probably don't have like millions of dollars to put into a serious treasure, but it'd be cool to hide something. Like really easy that like, you know, maybe some other like little kid one day could find this treasure and like have little pictures of us. Or I don't know. This is getting just really intense. Maybe not. Uh, anyway, grandchildren, uh, I'll see you guys in the next entry.